वेलकम बैक टू मिक्स मसाला वी टी जी आई एम चंदन गोपाल ए के ए फंक ब्लू एंड बिग नमस्ते फ्रॉम इंडिया फॉर दिस सेशन वी हैव ए वंडरफुल इंडिविजुअल हु इज़ एन आर्टिस्ट विजुअल आर्टिस्ट फ्राम यू एस बट इज सेटल्ड इन उदयपुर एंड ही हैज़ बीन डूइंग हिज प्रैक्टिस फॉर लॉन्ग टाइम इन कोलेब्रेशन विद द लोकल आर्टिस्ट इन उदयपुर थैंकफुली द आर्टिस्ट had agreed to you know share a lot of his stories which had influenced or had an great impact in how and why he works the way he works right this entire session will be divided into three parts part 1 an introduction part 2 more about his methods process uh, in attaining the kind of visuals he has in mind or in his ideas and part 3 gives more stories about how visuals come about and also as a teaser it also gives some insights about his newly published book Karkhana a studio in Rajasthan by Vasco X Vasco you can follow him and you can check out his works his older works on his website Vasco x vasco dot com and remember people this is Funk Blue brought to you by T G and welcome to the show. I am sitting with our speaker guest, an artist, Vasco, Vasco x vasco, Vasco x vasco, otherwise known as Evil O. Evil O. <laughs> and My friends call me Cha Cha. Cha Cha. Ah, that's that's Cha Cha. That's a good. That's a good name. I know. Chacha is like being called Chacha. What was this? But officially, I'm Wazo X Wazo. Wazo. It's yes. pretty. Uh, how do you say? Tongue twister. Wazo. It's a bit of a tongue twister. The family originally came from Russia. Okay. And we were Wazowskis. Wazowski. And then they moved through Poland into Germany, and in Germany, the ski ending got dropped, and we became Wazos. Okay. And then a lot of the Vaspos moved to different countries. A whole lot of them moved to New Zealand. Okay. And a small, very small group moved to the U.S. Okay. And in the U.S., the pronunciation got Americanized to Waswo. Oh. So that's how Waswo came about. So, you, like you, you were born in the U.S. Or? I was born in the U.S. I was born in a town called Milwaukee, which is an hour and a half north of Chicago. And uh, we're known for manufacturing beer and Harley Davidson motorcycles. Very oh. working class town. Very working class. Town. Harley Davidson. But we have a beautiful art museum, the Calatrava Art Museum. It was designed by Santiago Calatrava, the Spanish architect, and it's just gorgeous. Okay. Okay. That's. Totally It has a movable breeze soleil. Looks like wings. It goes up and down. Okay. Like this according to the light situation. It's a beautiful art museum. It's a good collection too. Okay. Unfortunately, the curating this year isn't so good, but the the collection is good. Right. Oh no, no. First, I have to ask: Is this going to be a hit piece? Is this <laughs> going to be titled "Testing Gopal Destroys Wazwo X Wazwo"? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I. This is more like. you know uh, a friendly conversation one interesting way to look at it is because i've never met you before right right we have no, never our first time. we have never but i i like your spotify station it's good <laughs> and uh, being in udaipur it's one of my favorite place also i come here time to time to visit my friends here and do some music and uh, some pretty uh, and i love the lakes here and the mountains also because it reminds me of my home of Maclorganj it's a mountain is area but uh yeah i thought like this time you know why not meet up with you and uh, you know get to know about your story like how what's your journey you know and what were maybe certain things that made you decide that yes i want to go to india and i want to maybe you know so so you want the usual like brief bio of how i ended up in udaipur for a boy from awaki who grew up with the uh, early davidson motorcycle <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm tra- after you mentioned like you come from such a place i was i'm like curious now you know like how 
because US is like totally different and uh, India and you you understand now. I'll give you I'll give you my brief bio in a nutshell the the unfiltered brief bio not the one that I put at the beginning of the blurbs of my books okay okay so I was born in Milwaukee lower middle class family mm-hmm. suburban home um, very white environment but I was part of the whole hippie movement when that came about during the Vietnam War all right. And many of us during that time, we didn't really want to fit into the system in any way. And I rebelled against my parents and I said, I moved out of the house when I was 18 with my first boyfriend, Eugene. Okay. And uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and I was actually studying English literature and creative writing. I thought I would be a writer and I still am a pretty good writer if I say so myself. I did learn something there. but I. You know, I was a dreamer. I wanted to be a poet, a short story writer, maybe a novelist, something like that. Worst came to worst, I'd end up a professor in a university. Well, it turned out I got very hooked on drugs and drinking, ended up dropping out, never got a degree, became kind of a stoner waste. This is all true. And uh, my brother died at an early age. He was the opposite of me. He was very straight-laced. He was totally into math and engineering and very early into the computer scene. He died, and I inherited a small amount of money from him, not much, but I used that amount of money to buy a house in an integrated neighborhood on Milwaukee's west side. Lived there for many years, and then a man named Edward Farber came about. So you were around what age, like? around that time. Oh, oh early twenties. Early twenties. Early twenty I was twenty one years old and I had my first house. Oh okay. you know, and like yeah, it was a matter of luck. I mean it was sad because I loved my brother. He was a big influence on me. Mm-hmm. In teaching me to think as a rationalist, a secularist, he was very much into science. Okay. okay. And uh, didn't have much appreciation for art, but he had a lot of appreciation for science. Which still influences me. And then um, So anyway, when I had the first house, um, I was kind of lost, and I was doing just working class jobs. I worked for years and years in a screen printing plant called Ryan Screen Printing, and we did not print anything beautiful. We printed screen circuitry. Uh So we were printing circuitry for membrane switches, which are the sort of switches that you find like on a microwave oven or something like Mm -hmm. that, or Mm -hmm. an air conditioner. And was that like uh, the only option that you had at that time? It was the best option I could find because I didn't have a degree and I did have some interest in craft and art even then. And it was a very, it was a very gay friendly shop. Nearly everybody who worked there was gay. Okay. Uh, a couple of lesbians and a lot of gay guys, a couple of straight people who had a hard time fitting in, honestly, <laughs> <laughs> but they did, and uh, we had fun, but I learned a lot about printing, and I developed a great appreciation for it, because I remember my boss, Tim Elmer, he was the foreman at the time, you know, I asked him, well, how long will it take me to learn how to screen print, and he said, well, you can learn the basics in a day or two days. But to really know it, you'll be like learning the piano. You have to practice mm-hmm. it for years mm-hmm. because there's all different kinds of materials and inks and weather conditions, and there's so many factors and variables you have to deal with in making a good one. And our prints had to be perfect. They were very, very precise. Oh, yeah. They had specs. They had to be within, you know, like a hundredth of a millimeter or something like so that. It was like you know? a so production center where you it had was to a production center, and eventually I became a foreman there and all of that. But I developed this appreciation for printmaking. I learned that like printmaking is difficult. Oh. And this was screen printing, which yeah. is one of the easier mm-hmm. forms of printing, actually. So anyway, I did that. And then in the meantime, um, I had a friend who brought a friend of his name, Edward Farber, to my house. And Edward Farber was an amazing man. He was a photojournalist. His photos always appeared in the newspaper but he had patented a lot of equipment on photography. So he had patented the strobo flash, which okay. could catch like a bullet going through a rope or something like that. Oh. He had patented some of these strobo flash, 
flashes and made a lot of money doing that. He had a giant house on top of a hill outside of Milwaukee overlooking the lake. Mm -hmm, Very mm -hmm. Budapur like, you know. Okay. And uh, but he took an interest in me. He was an older gay man and he one day literally put a camera in my hand and he said, This is your passport, it is your key to the world and I didn't understand him. And he said, What you need to go, he said there's a place in Milwaukee called the Milwaukee Center for Photography. Enroll in that. I will help you. You go to school. You learn photography, and this will open up doors for you because with the camera, doors will open. All you have to do is say you're a photojournalist, and you can go anywhere. All right. So he encouraged right. me and got me thinking again, and I stopped doing the drugs. So he died shortly after that, but he got me on my way. I studied at the Milwaukee Center for Photography for three years learned chemical process photography. It was a very old school, black and white, Ansel Adams kind of school. Mm -hmm. But very early on, I built my own darkroom in my house, and I discovered a love for sepia toning, so, which is a chemical process. Uh, so I learned how to sepia tone a photograph, and I loved the fact that it just took you out of the present reality and took you into some sort of mystical other world. You I know? think this is a very important... Uh, story that you are sharing now because it gives the it gives me and whoever is listening you know that you know why photography approach is coming in your work now also you know yes. because you know you look at your artwork and uh, you you can see like even though uh, you had mentioned that uh, these uh, images are hand painted but very photogenic you know it has that photographic uh, elements also depicted in within the paintings yes, also yes. You know? and it's a very interesting story to actually know well, this is an evolution and first of all I have to say like the original sepia photographs which became my first book here in the uh -huh. poems which were all sepia photographs chemically processed sepia tone is a very specific process that gives you this gold this uh, rich brown color and People now equate sepia tone with nostalgia because mm -hmm, old mm -hmm. photographs always had kind of that brown tinge. So you worked a lot with films and uh, yes. you know, analog. And it was all analog. analog or right. Digital hadn't been invented yeah. yet. The friend who is a bird watcher, he works now in the United Nations uh, for environment or something. Okay. So he was like my mentor for uh, photography. And he had and he had come to Dharamshala to do a research on the uh, population of vultures. So the number of uh, vultures were going down because of some issues that were happening. So he was there for documenting this thing. And uh, so yeah, my mom introduced me to him. And uh, from very young age, I was really much into you know wildlife and uh, doing uh, photography of uh, birds and things like that. And he would hand me this, I was just like the, how do you say, what's that word called, uh, you know, just holding his equipment. Right, <laughs> you were the assistant. Yeah, and I was really young. And the cameras were like so heavy, and he has those like really... Those giant, yeah, those giant lens, and you need and those for... Doing early those in the morning topic. I had to go and like, and he would tell me to like, you know, come with me, and, uh, and after a year or so, then he gave me a camera and he was like, now you start shooting, you know, and I couldn't even like hold the camera, but it was very heavy. So I was like always into drawing. So he was your Ed Farber, he got you going. Yeah, so, okay. and uh, he always, my mom and everyone in the family always supported me because like, I, I used to be very quiet, even in college also, if you ask, uh, very few people I talk with openly, otherwise I normally just stay in my own zone. I'm like that kind of person. But uh, yeah, and I think that's very important, like when you have a friend or someone, you know, who tells you, you know, gives you something and you're like, okay, you do this and things are going to open up, you know? Yeah. You know, I think it's very you important. Need, you need older guides in life. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that's so true. And I mean, I was lost when I was young because I didn't really know what I wanted to do mm -hmm. in my life. I wasn't sure. My mother was an artist. She painted. All right. She did very traditional landscapes and oil. 
um, I had a cousin, my, actually it was my cousin's husband, Ed Green, who worked with the Milwaukee Public Museum, which was a natural history museum. Mm -hmm. But he actually supervised the teams of artists that painted the backgrounds of the dioramas. So you'd have like the taxiderm uh -huh. tigers or lions or something in a display case, and then he supervised the artists who would make it look real with the painted background uh -huh. and uh -huh. all of the props. And I used to go to the museum, and I would be left behind the scenes in the museum all the time because I could go visit Ed, and he would show me these different things. Which okay. Was, you know, and this is the Department of Entomology or something like that, you know. <laughs> and I see the man who made the giant insects out of fiberglass yeah. and all of this. So that was part of it. And then his, his wife, Doreen Green, was a uh, teacher of art in the public schools. And I had a couple aunts. Uh, great aunts who lived in the Rocky Mountains, and they had actually died. I think one of them had committed suicide, but they also painted landscapes. So in my family, and even my father dabbled in painting a little. Okay. So in my family, there was no stigma about wanting to be an artist, but everybody said it's very, very hard. You can't support yourself on it. It's going to be a very difficult journey, yeah. which it was and still is. Mm -hmm. know, I work all the time contrary to popular belief. <laughs> and um, anyway, I want to go back to the sepia and, and my journey because sepia everybody thinks is nostalgic now, but that's only because we look back and all the old photos are brown. But originally sepia was thought to be more rich mm -hmm. and a more beautiful photo than the pure black and white. So initially they sepia on photos because they thought they were more beautiful. And it's also more archival because the sepia process actually helps fix the photo better and make it more better for preservation. So anyway, I did India poems, and then I thought, well, my connection with India, how did that happen? My father had been in India during World War II. So before we uh, get into uh, okay. India... I'm just rattling through my file, no, 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 but you can interrupt me at any time. <laughs> so, so, when... So you had your camera and you started taking photos and during that period, how did you decide, like, were you just uh, taking pictures of randoms? Uh, I was like any young photography student and I was taking pictures of almost everything. And I have kind of a funny story about that because our first assignment was to photograph a plant okay. and put it up against a black backdrop and put it up against a white backdrop and photograph it with different settings and exposures and see how they vary. Okay. Very basic. And I took this stupid Sansevieria plant, we call it a snake plant, it's a very dull house plant, and I just took it like a science experiment. I just photographed it like they said, I brought it in. And when I went in, all the other students in the class had these beautiful photos of plants. Uh -huh. And mine was just this, this <laughs> dead-looking plant sitting in a pot, totally not artistic. And the teacher was like, you didn't do anything with it. You didn't do anything with it. You have to do something with it, you know, like that. And then, I mean, then something clicked. And it was like, yes, of course, I'm supposed to be here to make art. I'm not just doing science experiments. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a slow learning learner sometimes, and uh, but anyway, my father had been in India World War II and Mumbai, and then up to Karachi. It was before partition. He ended up on the base of the Himalayas, um, working with uh, what was now called the Flying Tigers, but he was totally ground based, okay. flying armaments over Burma, okay. over the hump into China, and then he ended up in China at the end of the war. So he had a big photo album, which I still have, which is titled China, Burma, India. And um, oh. as a kid, I would look through that photo album, and I was just entranced. So I always knew I wanted to come to India. All oh, right. And I first time I came was 93. I only spent like 10 days. Landed in Delhi. India was a very different place in 93. There was no metro. There were still cows walking around in the middle of Connaught. After one year, I was born. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I was so I had such culture shock. I literally like hid in my hotel the first two days. I was afraid to leave the hotel, and then I finally got out and about. And I was captured by an auto rickshaw man. So you you had an idea about India through your through my dad through right. your dad and photographs right. 
Okay, and when you... But I still experience the culture shock. Okay, you experience... Yeah. I don't think I would these days because India has so modernized. Right. But in '93, it was still rather third worldish, you mm -hmm. know, even in Kanaka okay. days. So, and I hadn't experienced that before, honestly. And uh, <clears throat> so I was captured by Rickshaw Walla and took me to a travel agent found down some dark alley, and at night. And they said, "Where do you want to go?" And I knew I I wanted to go anywhere but the Taj Mahal, because I knew everybody did the Taj yeah. Mahal. I wanted uh -huh. to do something different. So I pulled out my lonely planet guide, and I opened it up, and there was a photo. <laughs> and the photo showed this beautiful lake with temples and gods, and underneath it said Udaipur. And I said, I want to go to Udaipur. Right. And so they sold me a round-trip ticket, air, from Delhi to Udaipur, and 10 days, I think it was, at the Hotel Hilltop Palace, which is a rather nice hotel. And the whole package was $400 at the time. Mm -hmm. So I came to Udaipur. I had a wonderful rickshaw walla named Khan, and Khan drove me all around. Um, there was a boy staying in the hotel named Sarab, who I met with an Indian businessman. And he actually treated me to dinner at the Lake Palace. In those days, you could just go to the Lake Palace for dinner if you wanted to. Ooh. So Sarab and I went on the boat to the Lake Palace, and he treated me to dinner. I was surprised, you know, but he had some money. He was a businessman, and he wanted to show me a good time. And then afterwards, we took off our shoes, and we dangled our feet in the lake, waiting for the boat to come. And when we got back, we decided we would walk back to the hotel, uh -huh. which is quite a distance. So we literally walked through the streets of Udaipur with bare feet oh. back to the hotel, and I never will forget that. It was such a beautiful, beautiful experience. And were you were you also uh, doing your photography? Not at that night. Not no. at that night. And uh, I did take some photos on that trip, though. With, I think, an old Nikon FE2 or something. It was before I bought my Rolleiflex. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I fell in love with the country. And when I went back to the U.S., I found, even though I'd been away for almost a year, because I'd gone to Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. other places, Thailand. All I did was talk about Udaipur in India. So then, next time I came back was 1999. I spent a month here, the month of March. I went to Jaipur on the train, and I met a taxi driver named J2, who had an old ambassador taxi. Mm -hmm. I still have a photo of him. It's called My Private Driver J2. It's a beautiful photo. Mm -hmm. And um, he drove me around Rajasthan. So he drove me to Jodhpur and then Jaisalmer and Bikaner. We made the circuit. Not who they put that time. Okay. And uh, I fell in love with Rajasthan totally. Had a wonderful time. And then in 2000, the end of 2000, Tommy and I came here the first time together. Mm -hmm. And Tommy also took him a while, but he fell in love with it by the time we got the push car. And speaking of this, by that time, I had looked at that Lonely Planet guide again. Huh. That photo was mislabeled. It was push car, because now when I look at the photo, I know this is push car, and then underneath it said Udaipur. <laughs> so I said, it's not Udaipur, that's push car, I could see. So I actually came here totally by mistake. And... Um, but we had this wonderful time, and then we both just decided we wanted to stay here as long as we could. Okay. And one thing led to another, and you know, then pretty soon we were spending six months of the year here, then we were spending eight months of the year, then we were spending ten months of the year here, and then finally we sold all of our property in the U.S. We just said we're going to live in Asia. But India's immigration laws has become more and more strict. So technically, I'm not supposed to be in India for more than six months at a time now. So you come in like... I have to go to Thailand. Tommy moved to Thailand. I generally go visit Tommy for a few months of the year. Uh -huh. And if I'm lucky, I apply for an extension. So I might be able to swing like eight months of the year in India. But every year I have to spend about four months out of the country. Okay. And that's generally my Thailand time. When I, go to okay. Thailand. I never go back to the U.S. I mean... I just went back to the U.S. now because uh, there was a new museum opening that had some of my collection in it. Mm -hmm. I gave a talk at the Asian Society, the Society for Asian Art at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, and I had some things to do there, but normally I don't go back to the U.S. much at all, maybe once every five years or something. Okay. Like that. Okay. 
right? And when you like uh, just now, you told me that uh, you had done an opening, right, for the museum. Hmm. You had gone there to give a talk. I had formed. How, how was the response? What happened there, like? is when we sold our houses in the U.S. because. Tommy and I had bought a lot of houses in the U.S. as rental properties. Mm -hmm. It's really how we made our money. You know, they would use the term property dealer here. Okay. And we called our, we just called ourselves landlords. And we, we rented to young Gen Xers who all liked us as people because they thought we were kind of cool. And uh, but anyway, we made our money. And then when we sold the houses, the, the housing market was very high. So we got a lot of money came in, which we live on, and uh, helps us live at any rate. And uh, so then I forgot what your question was. So the question is, <laughs> like, when you were uh, <coughs> when you were giving your talk there in the Asian oh, society. Oh, I started. I you know I've always been like into giving back to India because to me India has been so good to me. Mm -hmm. because it's very rare that a foreign artist in India gets any kind of attention. And if they do get attention, it generally lasts for one exhibition and then it's over. But India has had some sort of fascination with me, so I'm rather lucky because I've been in the news now since what, what, 2001. What's your, like, uh, so, I mean, because you're coming from U.S. and you're living here now in Udaipur, uh, the kind of interactions that are there with Indian artists and foreign artists, like outside artists, uh, regarding your work, how is it? How do you like uh, see yourself? Wow. Well, uh, I was going to answer the first question first. But okay. How do I see myself? Um, because it's a lot of uh, back and forth, you know. And for you also. Well, I decided that I wanted when I did the India poems photographs. I decided that it seemed to me like most foreign artists, be they American, British, French, Australian, or Japanese, mm -hmm. when they came to India, they photographed here, then they always went back to their home countries to have exhibitions. Mm -hmm. And I thought I really want to exhibit in India because I want feedback from Indians. So we organized the Traveling India Poem Exhibition, and Rajan Pulari, the printmaker, uh, became a friend because he was based in Goa, that's where I met him. And uh, he suggested I go to Alliance Francaise in Goa and pitch a show. Mm -hmm. So I did that. So that was your first show it, in India? It was actually my second because my first show was at Kashi Art Cafe in Kochi. Because okay. I was friends with Anup Skaria, who's now passed away, and Dory Younger, who ran Kashi. And then Alliance put me on the circuit, so pretty soon I was showing at Alliance Frances in Bangalore, and uh, we went to Sri Lanka. We showed them at Alliance Frances in Colombo and in Kandy, and this is when, I mean, I still didn't have a lot of money. I had an assistant named Srinu who was from Hampi, and like we would, I was so paranoid. Like, I was so paranoid that, like, nobody would, people would scratch my photos if I let other people frame them. So I had the frames made, and I always would put the photos in uh, myself. Just, like, scratched your photo me? I was, uh, because the, the silver gelatin prints scratch uh, very uh, easily. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And they take so long to mm -hmm. make. Each, each photo takes, like, a day to make. So I was, like, uh, very paranoid about them getting damaged. So I always got very heavily involved in the framing and the cleaning, and every time we ship, I would take them out of the frame so that if the glass broke, they wouldn't scratch the so photograph. the entire process of uh, uh, bringing out a picture was also at that time uh, you were doing in India, right? No, I was, was at like that time I was still printing back in the U.S. All those photos were Okay, printed. so you would come to India, take photographs? And you would process it in yes, the U.S.? Yes, I processed in the U.S. That's before we sold the houses. Okay. All the processing was done. All right. There. And, uh, and how so, was, how so was like the in, in, in Sri Lanka, I remember taking all the photographs of the candy on the train. And I remember, like, we printed the invitations in Colombo, and then they needed them in candy, and we ran up on the train to candy just to deliver the invitations, like, two weeks before the show. And then we went back to Colombo. So... We did all these crazy things, you know, that, that, and then, oh, and then, you know, 
uh, what was happening at the time? The show in uh, in Colombo, I think Colombo. it was. Um, under George Bush, we were bombing um, Iraq, I think it was. And if you remember, the French did not join us on that. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of tension between the French, uh -huh. the French, and the Americans. And um, the French, oh, the Americans were actually going out on the steps of the Capitol and pouring out bottles of French champagne because they were so angry at the <laughs> French, you know. And uh, so suddenly I was at Alliance Francaise, and I was an American, and the director of Alliance Francaise was very adamant. He said. I want you to bring the American ambassador to this opening. <laughs> oh. So I said, okay, I'll try. So I had to go to the embassy and ask for an audience with the American ambassador, but he wasn't in town. But I got in contact with the first secretary or something like that came to inaugurate okay. the show. Okay. You know, but that that was a little political <laughs> night, you know, yeah. a little political <laughs> night. The Americans have to come and inaugurate that. We want them in this building, you know. Okay. So and we had so much fun doing it, actually, you know, in retrospect. And then, oh, and I was horrified when I went to the American embassy in Colombo because they had a beautiful Frank Stella painting. And the, okay. the current the first secretary or whatever had it hanging in his office, and he said, you know, when I took over this place, they had it stored in the janitor closet with the brooms and the mops and everything else. Oh. And he opened up the door and he said, my God, that's a Frank Stella. And it was a big one. And he had it pulled out and hung in his office. And so, you know, he said, I don't know what goes through, through people's minds. Anyway, um, yeah, so that all happened. And then, yeah, so the controversy started to erupt because Many Indians and Sri Lankans really loved the photographs because they were pictorialists. They were beautiful pictures of landscape and very nice portraits of people. But then I had people jump on me and say they were Orientalists and had a white gaze. And I often heard, why are you photographing poor people? Mm. They, it was sort of like, why aren't you photographing the modern Indian with their SUVs? Because India at the time was locked in this rivalry with China because they were both being promoted as the rising tigers of yeah. Asia. Yeah. So they wanted me to portray a modern developing India, whereas so they, I was fascinated... They mean uh, the people, the spectating people? Yes. They, it, like they were more Some inclined? Of them. Some okay. of them, you know. Generally the ones who went through university and had that postmodernist viewpoint. Yeah, you we know. do get a lot so, of debates when... Uh, like when it comes to down to photography, you know, like uh, in fine arts or in art communities, there's always this debate, you know, like when outsiders, like foreigners, right, right, you know, they right. come out and they always tend to focus on the poor and the uh, dirty aspect but of me, the society. But to me, all of my photographs are beautiful. I mean, mm -hmm. the people I mm -hmm. photograph are beautiful in their features and the way they carry themselves and just their poise and everything else. I mean, it wasn't like I was photographing people, you know, eating in the mud or anything uh -huh, like that, uh -huh. you know. And I've actually, you know, since then, I gave a talk in Jaipur at the beginning of the Jaipur Photo Fest one time, which was well attended. People flew in from Delhi for it, actually, and I was the first talk on the inaugural night. And But I've done this in other places as well, and that is I will show a series of photographs on the screen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'll tell people, I'm not going to tell you who took these. Okay. Just look at them, and I want you to raise your hands. I'm going to ask you, raise your hand if you think this was photographed by an Indian, or raise your hand if you think this is photographed by a non-Indian foreigner. All right. Okay. Over 50% of the time, they would get it wrong. Okay. And to me, that totally disproves this idea of a yeah. white gay. Yeah. It's like, you, if you can't tell who's white and who's brown without being told, totally. and don't talk to me about the white gaze. Exactly. You know? Now, I do believe there's such a thing as a colonial gaze, because when you look at the old colonialist photographs, obviously there was a, of course. we're the yeah. masters, you're the conquered, line up in front of this yeah. backdrop, and they all look miserable and sad, and they don't even want to be there. <laughs> and those ethnographic yeah. photographs make me True. cringe. True. But to compare that to what I do, to me, it's apples and oranges. And lovely people, this is the end of part one with the artist Vasvo X Vasvo. 
we will be continuing his stories and other important aspects which I figure is very vital for an individual to understand the ideas of an artist and how it comes to be you know the final product or the final artwork uh, so yeah more on part two and part three thank you for listening and remember you can follow me on my social media pages it will be a big help if you can share it with all your friends and yeah if you have any questions anything that you would want to share do let me know you can dm me in my social media pages and you can email me 